In our last episode, we finally found the gang members known as the family who are responsible for the attacks on the nearby town of Arafu. We met their leader, Vance, and the entire cast of characters that make up the family and learned that they describe themselves as vampires. They're really cannibals who have decided to stop eating meat and only drink the blood. We were sent here by Lucy West from Megaton to find her lost brother, Ian. The family told us that he was locked in isolation in order to meditate, but after obtaining the password to his cell, we activate the security terminal just outside to unlock the door. Inside, we find two options to activate internal security or a Protectron security unit, but neither of these two work. After unlocking the door, we see Ian standing alone in a room filled with rubble. After he sits down at his bare table, we can finally confront Ian West. Uh, what do you want? I've been looking for you. I guess I shouldn't be surprised. I'm sure Evan King is pretty pissed right about now. I bet he has the entire town out looking for me. He's worse than my parents. You're a tough man to find. Well, maybe that's because I don't want to be found. Why the heck are you looking for me anyway? I'm sorry to tell you this, Ian, but your parents are dead. You think I don't know that? You think I don't know what I did? I'm here to take you home. Home? I don't have a home anymore. I made sure of that, didn't I? Pack your bags. We're getting out of this insane asylum. Why can't everyone just leave me alone and let me make my own decisions? I can't stand this anymore. I don't even know who I am anymore or where I belong. My real family is gone because of me and Vance is all I have now. Look, Ian, I know what you did. Vance told me everything. Then you must think I'm some kind of a monster. Well, after what I've heard, yeah, but why don't you tell me what you did in your own words? I killed them. My own parents. Get a hold of yourself. Don't you understand me? I killed them, okay? My mother and father are dead because of me. Look, it doesn't matter. The past is the past. It's time to move on. Of course it matters. The past is what's keeping me up at night. That night is like a bad dream. I can see parts of it, but I don't remember what happened. It was the fucking hunger. That thing that's haunted me my entire life. I give up. Fine. Stay here and cry. <laughs> Just like Vance said, humans will never understand us. Just sit on their high horse and ridicule us. Well, fine. You can judge us any way you see fit, but one thing's certain. I'm not leaving. Now get the hell out of my room. Look, Ian, I know loss too. I know it hurts. But staying here isn't the answer. There's something inside me. Something completely messed up. Maybe I can help you. Help? How can you help? I'm a mutant. A fucking freak. The only person I was ever able to talk to was my sister Lucy and she's gone. No one gives a shit about me except Vance and the family. Can't you understand that? Yeah, I know something's completely messed up. You and these people are all a bunch of murderers. Vance said it's not murder. Hell, we kill Brahmin every day just because we need to eat. Why is that okay? Vance was right. You humans will never understand what we're all about. This whole conversation is a waste of time. Get the fuck out of my room. At this point, we see a number of options to convince Ian either to stay here with the family or to go back to his parents' home in Arafu. There are two options to allow Ian to stay. We can say, if your sister Lucy is still alive, I bet she misses you. She does? If she cared so much, why did she leave when she did? My parents would have never understood. They would have called me a freak and kicked me out. No, I'm sorry. Vance and the family are the only ones that could possibly understand what I'm going through. Or we can say, then stay. I think you belong here with the family. Thank you for understanding. This place is all I've got and I don't want to lose it. Would you speak to Vance for me? I still need some time alone before I'm ready to talk to anyone else. Now the two options we have to convince him to leave only work if we previously met Lucy West or if we have a high speech skill. If we have the letter on our inventory that Lucy gave us, we can hand it to Ian and say, Read this letter. Your sister Lucy wrote it. I bet it'll change your mind. She... she really misses being home and she's asked about me and here a lot. I think I had it all wrong. I shouldn't have come here. I bet Lucy is feeling just as bad as me. Or we can pass a speech check to say, 
Let's go home, Ian. The only way to beat your nightmares is to face them. You know, for a second there, you sounded just like Vance. And you're right. I don't know what I'm running away from, but given time, maybe things can go back to the way they used to be. Please tell Vance I've made my decision. I'm going home to Arfu. I hope to see you there as well. I'm just gonna gather my stuff together and say my goodbyes, then I'll head on back. Now, annoyingly, Ian has a lot more information about what happened the night his parents died, which I think is vital information we need to know before he decides whether to stay or to leave. But sadly, we don't have access to that dialogue tree until after we nudge him to make his decision. But it's so important to the decision that I'm going to go through it now. After he makes his decision, we can come back to Ian, whereupon he thanks us. I wanted to thank you one last time for what you've done for me. My brain feels like less of a mess now. I think I may be seeing clearly for the first time in years. Don't worry about me. I've been through a lot, but I think I'm going to be okay. I know it's painful, Ian, but let's talk about what happened in Arafu. It actually kind of makes me feel better to talk about it. Go ahead. Why did you do what you did to your own parents? I wish I could answer that. I really do. I don't even remember it happening. When the hunger takes over, it's like being pushed aside, like something else is controlling me. I can see what's happening, but can't close my eyes. I don't even remember exactly what happened until Vance knocked on the door. How did Vance know you were one of them? That's the weird thing. He has some sort of crazy sixth sense about or something. Maybe all of our kind do. As soon as I was with the family, I really felt at home for the first time in my life. It's like all these people are my real brothers and sisters. How did you end up leaving Arafu? I don't remember how long I sat there on the floor staring at my parents' bodies. It seemed like days I wanted to feed, to eat their flesh. But it was like a little bit of me was holding on. Then, out of nowhere, there was shouting outside and a knock at the door. I opened it, and it was Vance. He seemed to know exactly how I was feeling inside. He took me under his arm and we left. I never looked back. I saw the family's mark on the wall in your parents' home. What's up with that? Vance told me later that he was basically covering for me and allowing the family to... to feed at the same time. Since my parents were already dead, they drank their blood and left the mark on the wall. He didn't want Evan to suspect that I had done it. The irony is they were stalking our town to feed anyway. It's almost like Vance knew this would happen. When did you first discover that you had the hunger? I was about 10 years old and I was playing with Lucy down under the overpass. We loved throwing rocks in the water. We saw some wastelander trying to break open the Brahmin pens and steal one of them, so I ran over and told him to stop. He just laughed and pushed me away. When I fell, suddenly my head started to hurt and my eyes got all blurry. It was almost like I blacked out. Next thing I know, Lucy was pulling me off the guy. I had ripped his throat open with my teeth. What did Lucy say she saw you do to that wastelander? She said I, like, changed into another person, that I even glared at her and raised my arms like I was going to kill her. The wastelander took a swing at me with some kind of club. I turned around and jumped on him. I tore his throat open with my teeth. If he wouldn't have done that, Lucy may have been killed too. I just don't know. Did you ever talk with your parents about it? Lucy said Mom and Dad would never have understood. She told me to keep what I did a secret and that she'd try and help me. Thanks to Lucy, she was able to stop that from ever happening again for years. Every time I'd feel the hunger, she'd hold on to me and not let go. After a while, the hunger almost seemed to go away until, well... Do you really believe in vampires? I don't know. I really don't. I mean, I'm not totally dumb. I know they were in stories and all that. But who knows? Maybe Vance is right and vampires were just people like us who learned to control their hunger and drink only blood. I mean, vampires are regarded as feared monsters instead of hunted animals, like cannibals. Kind of makes sense. That's all, Ian. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Goodbye. After we've heard Ian's story, and after Ian has made his decision, we can then find Vance to tell him the news. Now, Vance and his wife have a different sleep schedule than the other family members here, which makes a lot of sense. That way, they always have someone on guard. At around noon every day, he and his wife, Holly walk back to their bedroom. They climb into their bed, which makes this an opportune time to explore their room. In addition to a locked safe and various other loot in his room, we find a unique weapon called Vampire's Edge. 
It lies within his sword cabinet inside his room. It's locked with a hard lock, so if our lockpicking skill is not high enough, we can always pickpocket the key from Vance while he sleeps. The Vampire's Edge is a unique version of the Chinese officer's sword. It's better than a Chinese officer's sword, but it's far from the best sword in the game. It has 15 damage compared to the Chinese officer's sword's 10, but much less than other swords like Jingwei's Shock Sword, which has 35. It's no faster than a Chinese officer's sword, bringing its DPS up to 34.6, which is pretty decent, but nowhere near Jingwei's Shock Sword. It also has the same appearance as any other Chinese officer's sword. When done snooping around his room, we can wake him up to talk about Ian. I trust your talk with young Ian went well. I am quite interested in learning the results of your discussion. Did he come to a decision? How did you know that Ian was trying to decide to stay or leave? My fine friend, that poor soul has been wrestling with the same question every new member of the family asks himself when they arrive. Do I belong here or should I depart? All I ask is that they spend the time to reflect before deciding in solitude. Before I talk about Ian, there's still the matter of Arafu to discuss. As long as you maintain this level of civility, please proceed. You can't just prey on them anytime you're hungry. You wish to arrive at some sort of a bargain? Now we have quite a few ways to resolve this situation. We can simply appeal to the relationship that we've established with the family to ask them nicely to stop attacking the Arafu residents. After all, if they keep attacking Arafu, Arafu will eventually fight back until everyone is dead. Well put. I must say, your visit is a pleasant change from what I am accustomed to when dealing with humans. In light of this, I promise you that no further harm will befall you or Arafu. Of that, you have my solemn oath. Or we can pass a skill check, each of which grants the same result. We can pass a medicine check to say vampires can drink any kind of human blood, even from blood packs. Or a harder medicine check to say, I believe that blood preserved in blood packs could provide what you need. Or an intelligence check to say, there must be an alternative source to blood that you can survive on. Regardless the one we choose, he says... Curious. Many years ago, I survived by drinking from fresh blood packs I recovered from hospital ruins. The problem was that these blood packs were scarce. What do you propose? The final option is to pass a speech check to say, give those people a chance. They're defenseless. I suppose we could stop our raids on Arafu in light of this situation, but that just forces us to prey on others. We have three options, but only two work. We can say, I propose that Arafu will sell you blood packs, and in return, you leave the town alone. Although I appreciate what you are trying to do, please realize that we have no money or goods to speak of. What little money Carl makes with his shop goes to buying weapons and ammunition to protect ourselves. I am very sorry. But perhaps you can make a better offer? This leaves us with two remaining. These choices have different outcomes, but Vance responds to them in the same way. We can say, Arafu will donate blood packs and in return you leave the town alone, or Arafu will donate blood packs and in exchange, you and the family will protect the town. Agreed. Please, take this proposal to Arafu. Speak with them, and then return to me with their decision. I thank you for showing me that your kind can be trusted after all. It is a lesson I will not forget. He no. gives us Vance proposal, which we find in the miscellaneous section of our inventory. Sadly, we can't read it, but we can presume that it says whatever option we convinced Vance to choose. Now, what of young Ian? Tell me his decision. I'm not sure I should be the one telling you this. If you fear reprisal from the family regarding his decision, know that I would never hold it against you. And as for Ian having you speak in his place, I find his trust sufficient enough to accept what you say is truth. The only option we find left is to tell him the decision that we helped Ian come to. If Ian has chosen to leave the family... It saddens me to lose one of my flock, but I believe everyone has to follow their own path. All I was attempting to do was guide him. Now it seems that responsibility has fallen upon you. 
I hope you will be more successful. But if Ian has chosen to stay with the family... When you first arrived, I was suspicious of your intentions. I can see now it was an error in judgment. I can assure you Ian will be well cared for and safe with the family. Please, I want you to take this. Consider it as an apology to you for all the hardships you had to endure finding this place. Goodbye, human. Our time together has been rather educational. As a parting gift, he gives us the schematics to the shish kebab. If we have already found the shish kebab schematics, this upgrades the schematics, allowing us to build a more powerful weapon. With the negotiation done, we now need to head back to Arafu to talk with Evan to see if he will accept Vance's proposal. If we go back to Arafu, and Ian has chosen to return to Arafu, Evan hails us as a hero. There she is, the heroine of the day. He responds the same way to all three of these options. It's done, Evan. The family will never bother Arafu again. I know. I talked to Ian, and he told me everything you did. I don't know how you did it, but goddamn am I glad you walked up that ramp and lent us a hand. Thanks again, kid. Consider yourself welcome back here any time you're in this part of the wastes. Hey, it was a lot of work and you owe me big. If I had two caps to rub together, I'd still give them to you. Afraid I'm as poor as a Brahmin herder, though. I have a proposal for you from Vance, the family's leader. Interesting. It seems they wish to enter into some kind of agreement. I guess it's better than pointing my gun down that ramp all day and hiding inside at night. Let Vance know he's got a deal. We'll do it. I'll speak to the others. I'm sure they'll agree with me. Any other help you can provide would be appreciated. I've been saving up stuff for emergencies, in case things with Arafu got tremendously bad. You're welcome to some of it if you like. After completing the quest once a day, Evan will give us some sort of alcoholic beverage. If we ask more than once the same day, he says, Sorry, the wells run dry. All right, I gotta go now, Evan. Come on back soon. I may have some stuff for you. If Ian chose to come back to Arafu, at this point we'll find him inside his parents' old home. Thanks for setting me straight on everything. How are things going now? It's weird living in my parents' old house with them gone, but I'll make the best of it. Everyone around here is being nice to me despite what happened, so I guess it all turned out well. Thanks. If we didn't give him his sister Lucy's letter, we can do so now. She, she really misses being home and she's asked about me in here a lot. You have no idea how much this means to me. Thanks so much. We see that Ian has cleaned up the corpses of his parents and washed the graffiti drawn in blood from his wall. Alternatively, if Ian chose to stay with the family, Evan responds completely differently. I hope you killed every last one of those bastards. Well, holy shit, you're back. What the hell happened out there? Yeah, I took care of your problem, Evan. I don't know how you did it. But goddamn, am I glad you walked up that ramp? What about Ian? Did you find him? We have three ways to respond, all of which are lies. We can say, Ian's fine. He's living with Lucy and Megaton now. You're just full of surprises today, aren't you? Or we can say, sorry, but Ian is dead. Damn, that poor kid. And finally we can say, you know what? I just didn't find him. He wasn't with the family. Damn. Well, maybe he just made a run for Megaton or something. Hope you can find him one day. Sorry everything didn't work out. But consider yourself welcome back here any time you're in this part of the wastes. We gain karma regardless of the option we chose. And after checking in with Evan King, the residents of Arafu leave their homes and walk around. Don't mind Braley. She's in La La Land again. Hey, Ken. Now that I've solved your problem, if there's any help you can provide, I'd appreciate it. Well, all I can do is offer my repair services to you. I'm pretty good with fixing stuff. That's usually because Braley breaks everything, thinking she's making a cake or something. Despite what he says, his repair skill is only 12. But it's better than nothing. Heading on over to his wife... Hey-ho! Welcome back to our cozy village. Hey there. Hey, is there anything you can do for me? Why, yes. Let me give you one of my old-fashioned chocolate chip cookies. Enjoy. And she gives us a tin can. Bye-bye. 
What a gem. Heading into Karen's place. I'm glad I was wrong about you. Welcome back. We can ask her if she has anything for us. There are a few interesting places around here I've heard about. I don't know if they'll help you or not, but you're welcome to them. With that, she marks four new locations on our map. Shale Bridge, Five Axles Rest Stop, Rockbreaker's Last Gas, and Dickerson Tabernacle Chapel. If, however, Ian decided to stay with the family, he stays in his room. We can always go back to his room and ask him how things are going now. I've learned a bit more from Vance than I've been allowed around Moresti. I really think you helped me make the right decision. Thanks. No matter how we decided to end this quest, as long as we gave Lucy's note to Ian, we can head back to Megaton and check in with Lucy West. After the quest is done, we no longer find her in Moriarty's saloon. Instead, she walks around. I delivered your letter to Ian. Oh, thank you for remembering. With everything that's going on, I almost forgot about it. You have no idea how much this means to me. Thanks so much. Uh, I have to go now. Oh, okay, well, anytime you find yourself back in Megaton, be sure and look me up. She almost forgot about it, really? This is the woman who got on my case when I told her that I didn't have time to hunt down her brother. I finally find him and she says, oh, thanks, I almost forgot about it. Great. Well, I'm glad I could help out, Lucy. Jeez. But now we need to tell Vance that Arafu has accepted his proposal. Heading back to Moresti, we can say, Arafu has accepted your proposal. Excellent. I knew you would serve as an ambassador for us in good faith. I will dispatch Alan to Arafu immediately to help serve as their guardian and honor my end of the agreement. Your efforts surpass those of the average human. In fact, I feel almost like you are a member of our flock. If you ever wish to learn our ways, you have but to ask. And if we previously chose for Arafu to trade blood packs only if the family guards them, then Vance dispatches one of his family members to protect Arafu. Hey Vance, can you teach me the ways of the vampire? To be a vampire is a life commitment. It is not achieved by my words. It is something you earn by your own will and sincere meditation. Sadly, I cannot fully make you one of us, but I can teach you how the lifeblood of others brings us regenerative powers. Since your body lacks the way to extract blood as we do, you must find alternative sources for your nourishment. Drink deep of the blood, allow not a drop to spill. Feel the warmth as it spreads inside you. You are becoming one with the life force of another. They lend a part of themselves to you. For a brief moment, you are two entities becoming one. Allow the feelings to course through your body as you partake of the blood. Feel it empower you and make you stronger. Once you have done this deed, only then will you know what it is like to be a vampire. And after listening to that, we get the perk Hematophage, which allows us to get 20 HP from consuming blood packs. Can you teach me anything else, Vance? There is no more I can teach you. Use what little I have given you well, and carry that knowledge with honor. How are things going now? Very well, actually. Our truce with Arafu is coming to fruition. I've begun teaching my people to live off of the donated blood packs. The transition has been difficult, but we will manage. You've certainly done us a great service, and I can't thank you enough. Now, if we don't want to use blood packs because, well, stim packs are better, we can always sell our blood packs to Vance for 15 caps apiece. I can only offer my thanks. My people are getting accustomed to using these as a substitute for live prey. As compensation for your effort, allow me to at least give you something in return. Despite what he says here, he does in fact pay us. We get 15 caps per blood pack. After informing Vance, if we head back to Arafu, we not only see that Arafu has replaced all of its dead Brahmin, but we notice that that one shack by the Brahmin pens, which was completely boarded up, now has a functioning door. Heading inside, we see Alan. That's right, Alan from the family has moved on into Arafu. Hey, this is now his home. 
There isn't much here, but of note, there is a Pugilism Illustrated, which we can always steal. And at dusk, if we head back up to the overpass, we'll find Alan defending the town where Evan once stood. We can then check in with Evan, who is pleased to no longer have to defend the town himself. Things are much better. We all don't have to stay inside our houses, and we sleep much better at night. It hasn't been this peaceful in Arafu for as long as I can remember. The proposal you brought us from Vance should also ensure our safety. I don't think I'll ever be able to repay you. Now, if after completing this quest, we decide that we just don't like vampires, and we go back to Moresti and kill everybody... We inadvertently turn Arafu hostile. Heading back to Arafu, we not only see Alan, but also Evan and the other residents open fire on us. That's because after completing the quest, Arafu and Maresti are considered the same faction. This leaves only one way to kill the vampires and still complete the quest. To do so, we have to kill Vance, Holly, and all of the other vampires before Ian makes his decision. On his body, we find Vance's long coat outfit, which looks just like a regulator duster, but it has 10 DR, one charisma, one perception, and a bonus of plus 10 to small guns. After they are all dead, we can then talk with Ian, who has completely new dialogue. What's going on out there? I thought I heard guns. What's going on? Who are you? He has much of the same to say that we heard before, until he says, No one gives a shit about me except Vance and the family. Can't you understand that? We then have three ways to tell him that Vance is dead. If we answer sarcastically by saying, Sorry, pal. Vance is worm food. You son of a bitch! You killed him and you think it's funny? It was my only chance to understand what the hell is wrong with me and you messed it all up. Well, you can just go to hell. We get a message saying that both the family and the residents of Arafu are hostile, which seems strange. Why would Arafu become hostile at this point? Possibly because we angered Ian, and Ian attacks us, forcing us to kill him. Alternatively, we have two ways to respond respectfully. We can say, Vance is dead, Ian, I'm so sorry, or, well, Vance isn't going to be able to help anymore. He's dead? You killed him? but he was my only chance to understand what the hell is happening to me. We can then resolve the quest much the same way previously. If we convince him to stay, he stays here all by himself. We can turn in Lucy's letter, or we can convince him to go back to Arafu. Maybe you're right. It was easier to run away with the family than to face what I did. Go back to Arafu and tell Evan King that I'm coming home. I have a few things to pack, and I want to say my goodbyes to this place. Alone. We can then go back to Evan to complete the quest as normal. However, Arafu misses out on the opportunity to receive a guard from the family. And that is the full story of the family, Arafu, and the Moresti metro station. So which of these options is the right one? And what really happened that one night in Arafu when Ian killed his parents? At first, I was all gung-ho about killing these vampires and rescuing Ian. I thought it was pretty straightforward. The fact that they're killing other human beings, even if it is so that they themselves can live, is a disqualifier for me. The world is a better place without them. But when we sat down and listened to Ian, for the first time when playing this quest, I started to take Vance's vampire theory seriously. Because this is, after all, the Fallout universe, and what if Vance is right? What if, like ghouls before them, these vampire people have adapted to the wasteland? They've evolved a little bit. When listening to Ian's description, it sounded out of his control, like something possessed him to do what he did. And maybe other vampires act the same way. Maybe they really truly can't help themselves. In which case, can we hold them responsible for killing the people they've killed? Can we call that murder? 
especially if we can resolve things peacefully by convincing the vampires to no longer murder and to instead feast on blood packs. Then everyone wins, right? Well... First, let's just talk about cannibalism itself. In the real world, there's never a situation where cannibalism is acceptable. Now, there are plenty of situations where cannibalism is understandable. There have been plenty of times in human history where, due to famine, an ill-fated expedition, kidnapping, imprisonment, people have resorted to cannibalism just to survive. The horrible story of the Donner Party is an example. But the reason it's unacceptable despite that is not necessarily for moral reasons, but for biological ones. Cannibalism can lead to disease. In particular, cannibals are prone to being infected by prions. Prions are protein materials that can fold in structurally abstract ways, which lead to diseases that spread through a human's body much like a viral infection. One of these diseases is called Kuru, which is an incurable neurodegenerative disorder. Kuru leads to the total loss of coordination and muscle movements. Once you catch Kuru by eating human flesh, it can take between 10 to 13 years for the disease to incubate. But once fully incubated, a person begins to show symptoms. Symptoms which last around 12 months before the person dies. People infected with Kuru would have tremors. And more eerily, it was sometimes known as the laughing sickness because people infected would sometimes break out in pathologic bursts of laughter. Imagine this, they walk around town shaking uncontrollably and then start laughing maniacally. This isn't science fiction, it didn't come from a comic book, this is a real disease that you can only catch by eating human meat. This disease was widely studied while examining the tribe called the Four People of Papua New Guinea. For many years, these people practiced ritualistic cannibalism. Instead of burying their dead, they would cook and eat them. In their culture, this was seen as respect. It was their way of mourning. So like incest, cannibalism is not just a moral taboo, but it can lead to biological consequences that can harm an entire society, which is likely why it became morally taboo to begin with. People evolved to be repelled by things that could hurt themselves, their family, and their people. But that's cannibalism. What about drinking blood? Well, we have the same issue. Drinking human blood is toxic. We have to remember that human blood is designed to be in our blood vessels, arteries, capillaries, in many places in our body, but not our stomachs. The reason it's toxic for humans is because it's so rich in iron. Swallowing a little bit of blood is not that big of a deal, just like taking a little bit of medicine isn't going to immediately cause you to overdose. But if you subsist exclusively on blood, and you drink it every day as your only source of food and energy, then that likely will cause you to overdose on iron. This leads to a deadly condition in humans called hemochromatosis which causes disease, can damage the liver, cause a buildup of fluid in the lungs, lead to dehydration, give you low blood pressure, cause nervous disorders, and ultimately kill you. So from a strictly biological perspective, both cannibalism and vampirism are detrimental to a human's survival and detrimental to the human species, so it really should not be acceptable even in a post-apocalypse. But this is all under the presumption that these vampires are operating under understood modern-day normal human biological conditions. What complicates the matter is that Vance says that he and his family members have mutated. They've developed an evolutionary adaptation which allows them to drink blood and eat flesh, presumably without suffering the negative consequences of doing so. If that's the case, then all of the negative things I just listed don't apply in this case. This leaves us with a handful of other moral issues. The first is that both Vance and Ian objected to the Lone Wanderer's use of the word murder to describe their activities by pointing to what we do to the animal kingdom. We hunt and kill animals in order to survive. How is that not murder? They're doing the same thing. They're hunting and killing humans, but only to survive. Well, this kind of thinking not only ignores the obvious differences between humanity and the animal kingdom, but it also erodes the concept of murder to begin with. Animals kill each other for a variety of reasons, not just to eat, but also for fun. 
There are plenty of videos online of orcas, for example, killing baby seals just to use their bodies as balls, to toss them around just to play with them and have fun. Then when they're done with their fun, they just swim away. They don't eat the seal. No one consumes its flesh. They used it as a toy. Is that murder? Well, no, we wouldn't call it murder because that took place in the animal kingdom. Murder is a uniquely human concept. The major difference between killing and murder in the human world is that murder is the unlawful killing of another human being. Now, with this reasoning, one could say then there is no such thing as murder in a post-apocalypse because there are no laws, which is very true. But I believe that there are still universal human moral laws that everyone, regardless of culture, religion, society, race, location, still believe and still follow, even if it's not written in stone. One of these universal human laws is that every man should be free to build his own life as long as by doing so, he doesn't rob others of theirs. Sure, I have the freedom to build a dam to generate electricity, but if by doing so I drown a village, that's murder. Sure, I have the freedom to build a business, but if I operate that business with slaves, that's immoral. And of course, I have the liberty to eat and to survive, but if I do so by preying on other humans, that violates this almost universally understood moral law and is, consequentially, murder. So Ian and Vance's argument here is really an argument against the idea of the word murder. They just don't want that word to exist because it places a taboo on what they're doing, which makes them uncomfortable. But Vance and his vampires here at Moresti are different from the cannibals we found at Andale because they only drink the blood. In his terminals, Vance described the eating of flesh as filthy, unclean. These are words we find in the Old Testament to describe certain kind of meats. It's interesting to find them here on his terminal. Why does he believe that eating human meat is unclean? I don't think it's for moral reasons. After all, he's still comfortable with killing people for their blood. He's still comfortable with drinking blood. So why did he suddenly decide that eating the flesh was somehow unclean, but drinking the blood is still cool? It's never really explained. It seems odd to me sounds just like one of Vance's weird quirks. And this brings up an interesting question, how do they feed to begin with? After all, they only drink the blood, so theoretically you don't need to kill a person to feast. You don't need to kill them to take a pint of their blood, and if you leave them alive, they can generate more blood for you in the future. So it's actually smarter to keep them alive and not to kill them. But what do these vampires actually do? Well, in their terminals, we learned in our last video that Vance frequently says, we only kill to feed. So we get the distinct impression that their members have killed in the past. And he argues for setting up shop really close to smaller settlements. Settlements like Arafu. Ian told us that Vance and his family were in the area stalking the town when they discovered that he had killed his family. Well, what were they there to do? This is where I get confused, because in his terminal, one of the laws is that they don't break into people's homes, but all of the residents of Arafu were in their homes. So how did they feed in Arafu? Did they somehow drug Evan while he was standing guard, slice him open, take some blood, sew him back up, and run away? It seems very unlikely to me. Now, a key piece to this puzzle appears when Evan tells us about the previous inhabitants of Arafu. He told us that there used to be many more families living here with their own little shacks, but after the family showed up, they all disassembled their shacks and one by one, moved on. And then when we interviewed the existing residents of Arafu, they told us a little bit about what the family did. They would shout at them, throw bottles at their homes, and otherwise harass these people, bully these people, make them afraid to go outside. That seems like odd behavior from a group of people who don't go out during the day because they don't want to attract attention to themselves. Shouting at a town and throwing a glass bottle is a pretty big way to attract attention to yourself. Also, there are only three or four people in the town of Arafu. How can their blood sustain a family as large as the one we find in Moresti? Here's how I think it all pieces together. 
when the family arrived at Moresti, they found the nearby town of Arafu. This was just after Lucy West left for Megaton. When they found the town, it had many more families, maybe 10, 15 more families living on that overpass. They decided to use Arafu as their feeding grounds. Every night, they went outside and began to harass the townsfolk until members of the town couldn't stand it anymore, disassembled their homes, and left, one by one. As they left, the family from Moresti would stalk them on their way, and when the townsfolk were far enough away from Arafu, the family would attack and kill them and feast on their blood. This is the only explanation that makes sense to me. It explains what happened to all of the former residents of Arafu. It explains how such a large family can subsist only on the inhabitants of that one town. It explains their otherwise perplexing behavior of bullying the town of Arafu by shouting at them and throwing bottles. But what it doesn't explain is what happened to the West family. I find Ian's account really interesting. He says that he doesn't remember killing his parents. And then he says that Vance showed up almost as if he knew it would happen. This makes me wonder if Ian really killed his parents at all. I wonder a lot about Ian's condition, because the way he describes it is strange. He never had any symptoms until he got into a physical altercation with a wastelander. Then after receiving an injury, he goes berserk, he goes feral. He said his head started to hurt, his eyes got blurry, it was almost like I blacked out. Well, did he almost black out or did he black out? He said he didn't remember anything until Lucy pulled him off the guy. Now, it's true that in this story, he was violent. He ripped open the throat of the Wastelander, but he was responding in anger to a perceived insult. The Wastelander was trying to steal their Brahmin. The Wastelander had pushed him away, some stupid small kid. What he did was almost a normal response in a situation like that. He responded with rage and anger. What might have happened is that he had a seizure. What if highly emotional events like this cause poor Ian to have a seizure? This would explain why he blacks out, why his eyes got blurry, and why he doesn't remember events that had happened. And what if he had a seizure the night his parents died? What if he walked into the house and saw his parents already dead? Overcome with emotion, he has a seizure or blacks out. Now, Evan told us that he often saw Vance and Ian talking down by the river. At some point, Vance and Ian had struck up a friendship, and during one of these riverside conversations, Ian may have disclosed his weakness to Vance. Vance might have known about Ian's blackouts. Vance, being a cunning man, may have tried to use this to the family's advantage. We already know that the family have a loose cannon in their ranks. In yesterday's video, we heard a conversation between the family members where Carl admitted to doing something to make the town of Arafu upset. Now, we presumed yesterday that he was talking about killing the Brahmin, but listen to what he says. He never says it was the Brahmin. They never even mentioned the Brahmin. What's up? Crappy as usual. No one's been by here in ages to buy anything. Vance is crawling up my ass causing that mess in Arafu. Well, you did kind of screw up. I mean, you didn't need to go and do all that stuff. He just wanted you to make them nervous. Whatever. Hey there, how's it going? Better, I suppose. I think Vance is finally calming down after Carl apologized for all that trouble he caused. It's about time. Carl's gonna get us in trouble at this rate. I hope he learns to calm down a little bit. What if it wasn't the Brahmin? What if Carl broke the rules of the family, broke into the West home, and killed Ian's mother and father? They knew that Ian was having one of his seizures, and so they waited for Ian to wake up to discover the horrible scene. And once he did, Vance was right outside the door to step on in and bring Ian back to Moresti, but not before the rest of the family fed on the bodies. Now, this is all real interesting, and it's all hypothetical. We're trying to piece together what really happened, but the end result is black and white. We have the potential to solve this quest in a way that benefits both parties. The family stops killing people, they drink blood from blood packs, and they guard Arafu. Arafu becomes safer, 
the wasteland becomes safer, and we don't have to kill any member of the family. That's a great resolution. The only thing lacking is justice. Where is justice for the murders of Lucy's parents and all the other wastelanders that the family has fed on for God knows how long? Weeks? Months? Years? If these events had happened in a civilized land, a land where there was an institutionalized justice system, then there's no way that these people should get away with what they've done. Even if they agree to only drink from blood packs, even if they agree to defend the town of Verifu, they should still receive justice for the murders they have committed. My problem is that this is not a civilized land. There is no institutionalized form of justice. We could go through here and kill everyone. That may make us feel better, but is that justice or just revenge? Revenge for Lucy's parents. In that scenario, really nobody wins. Ian loses an adoptive family, Arafu becomes less safe, losing their guards, and the lone wanderer misses out on experience, a new merchant, repeatable quests. I'm glad Bethesda gave us a peaceful way to resolve this quest where no one else dies. Because if they hadn't, this would be a no-brainer for me. I would kill the family. But because we have the opportunity to leave them alive with the confirmation that no one else will be murdered, and with the knowledge that the family is going to be productive, that they're actually going to help people, this makes leaving them alive, having Ian stay with the family at Moresti, and having Alan guard Arafu the best choice, in my opinion. As for morals, I don't know if it's the most moral choice, because there's that whole justice thing which is lacking, but it also doesn't feel morally right to me to just kill them all either. But what are your thoughts? How did you resolve this situation? Did you just kill them all? Did you send Ian back to Arafu? Or did you leave him in Moresti? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. I've got a new shirt in the shop, folks! Suspender set to maximum stun. On the front, we have the quote from my weekly show, Scotch and Smoke Rings, and on the back, a big old smiling face of yours truly. You can find this in shirts, mugs, and a variety of colors on my shop. You can find a link in the description below, or you can click here. Thank you so much for watching, folks. I publish a new Fallout video six days a week on a wide range of topics spanning all of the games. So if you want to make sure that you don't miss my next video, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. And if you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with a brand new video.